let's talk about tibiofibular syndesmosis. Um, this is where patients get what's called a high ankle sprain. So I'll talk a little bit about injury mechanisms, and then we'll focus in on the anatomy, and then we'll focus on imaging and a little bit on clinical management. So as opposed to a typical lateral ligament ankle sprain, the high ankle sprain is, is higher up in the ankle and is less common than the traditional lateral ligament sprain. Um, the mechanisms of injury are illustrated here where a patient may have his foot or her foot planted on the ground and externally rotate the foot, uh, pronate the foot. Um, in sports, it's often the case that it, it occurs when an athlete is landed on by another player. So here, an example of a football player who's running and this, this other player is tackling him and it comes in from the lateral aspect of his leg here. It looks like it's really externally rotated um, or focused in here where a force comes in laterally along the fibula um, causes distraction medially, like the deltoid here, and but basically we're looking at injury of this syndesmotic complex. Another situation is in, in football here where offensive linemen or defensive linemen, they plant their feet very firmly and can kind of externally rotate, and just this type of foot planting um, can cause these types of injuries as well. So these are only about 10% of all ankle sprains. Um, they are fairly common in American football. Um, they uh, occur um, about three times per year in NFL teams. Uh, so they're fairly common in, in professional football. The key thing to remember is that they take longer to recover. So um, a classic lateral ankle sprain may take a few weeks to get back on the field, whereas these tend to take two or three times as long. It may take you know four to six weeks to get an athlete back from one of these injuries. And if they don't get recognized, they can lead to chronic pain, arthritis, um, instability of the tibiotalar joint. So here's the basic anatomy. Here we're looking anteriorly, fibula, tibia. And so this green ligament here, this is the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament. That's the anterior part of the syndesmotic complex distally. This cadaver specimen shows the same anatomy here where you can see tibia and fibula. And that this is the anterior inferior tib fib ligament here. As you continue cephalad, you see the syndesmotic, um, <clears throat> the interosseous membrane here forming the syndesmosis. Now we need to make sure you distinguish this ligament, tib fib ligament, from talofibular ligament down here, right? So here on the, the 3D Here's the talus. This is anterior talofibular ligament. That's the classic lateral leg ligament sprain, um, not to be confused with tibfib ligament. Similarly, if you look from a posterior approach, you have the tibia and the fibula, and you have this triangular shaped tibiofibular ligament, cadaver specimen, nice broad ligament, very um, strong structure binding the tibia to the fibula. And then, as, as I mentioned, ascending in the uh, entirety of the tibiofibular inner space is the interosseous membrane. And as you know, that uh, injuries about the ankle may be associated with kind of the ring concept where an injury distally may, may ascend and, and disrupt the interosseous membrane and then potentially even exit through the fibula. And this is why it's not that uncommon to see tibiofibular radiographs get done um, at the same time as ankle films. In, in practice, what the uh, orthopedists and sports medicine folks typically do, though, is, is understand that the patient has some kind of an ankle sprain and then palpate more proximally along the tib fib. And if it's non-tender and there's no pain up there, usually don't need to get radiographs more proximally. So here's just basic radiography as we get into the imaging of this. And this is something we see on the bone board um, every day and in the ER, <clears throat> tibia and fibula. And this little sclerotic line that you see along the tibia here is called the incisura tibialis. That's one of the things I learned from this, uh, this study that I did more recently. Um, <clears throat> and so the fibula is rather locked in to the, to the tibia here. This is the lip of the tibia that comes out here. <clears throat> like so to overlap with the fibula. 
And so this space normally should be like less than five millimeters here for that the, on the mortise view. And the mortise itself should be pretty congruent and symmetric throughout. So this width here should be about the same as the tibio tailor width and about the same as the width here. Okay, so that's a normal tibiofibular space. Um, <clears throat> these are obviously not normal. So the point is that these injuries of the ligaments can be associated with fracture or they may be purely ligamentous. And we're going to focus mainly on the ligamentous ones because injuries like this don't really require advanced imaging to figure out that that's actually uh, disrupted. So here there's clearly widening of the medial ankle mortise. There's widening of the tibiofibular space with this oblique fibular fracture. And this one is a fracture dislocation, right? So that's obviously clearly markedly widened. And, uh, you know, there's not much question that the, the interosseous membrane and syndesmosis are going to be injured in this situation. It's more the subtle things that come up. So here's normal. And then here's one, it's like, okay, that space is about seven millimeters. It's, um, it's, it's borderline abnormal. And then that's the question as well, if the patient has tenderness there, do they really have an injury to that syndesmosis or not? It's good to pay attention to this on CT as well. So normally you have this tibiofibular space here that's about five millimeters or less. And so in this patient that had fracture, you see widening of that space you see a little fracture fragment here that's probably like an avulsion from the tibiofibular ligament there. Um, and so it's relevant and important to look at that space there and to also look at the congruence of the tibiotalar articulation on good reformatted images. Okay, so here's normal, nice uniform space throughout, and here's abnormal where there's non-uniformity widening of that space. So we'll go through the MRI anatomy now, and I'll uh, kind of scroll through these images. So there's, a, um, there's an axial reference on the left, and then we're looking at the coronal images on the, on the right side of the screen. And so if I go anteriorly here, so here's tibia, fibula. We're going to be in the anterior tib-fib region here that I want you to spend time looking at this area right in here. And just notice how how steep and oblique that anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament is. So these black fibers, that's ligament right there, going like at about a 45 degree angle from tibia to the fibula. And so that's what it showed on the uh, cadaver specimens. Um, and we'll look at that again in just a second, but there's an there's a important point to that. As you get to like the mid part, you see a little bit of the interosseous membrane in here. It's usually quite thin, so it's not always that obvious to see. And then posteriorly, what you want to make sure you do is you stay oriented to exactly where you are. Because if you look in here, here's calcaneus, here's talus. So this structure, that's the posterior talofibular ligament. This is the tibiofibular ligament here. And there's often like a slip that goes obliquely kind of between the two. But you want to make sure if you're looking at the syndesmosis that you go up to the tibfib level and not to this level here, which is talofib level. Okay. <clears throat> So then if we look at the axial anatomy here, <clears throat> the point about it being oblique is that when we go through the axials, what we should expect is to see it first as you're going from, in, from, from superior to inferior, we'll see it first on the tibia and then over towards the fibula as you go through different sections. So I'm going inferiorly here. We're starting to see a little bit of ligament right there. And then as we go further inferior, you can see it cruising across. So as I scroll back and forth, I think you can appreciate how it's now it's an oblique ligament. So it's not something you always see in one plane, and you need to scroll through the images to see it in its entirety. The posterior talofib is a little bit more horizontal, so you can often see that in one plane. Okay. So here's an abnormal example. Here the radiograph is, I'd probably pass it, right? This space may be like six millimeters or so. It's pretty congruent. One important thing is that this is not a weight-bearing nor a stress radiograph, and so a patient could have an injury that doesn't show up without stressing the joint. And one of the things that the orthopedist will do is, is um, either try to get weight-bearing radiographs or they may need to stress a patient um, under fluoroscopy, and they may need to stress them even under anesthesia if it's too painful to, to assess for, for um, stability of this joint. Axial T1-weighted MR. T2 fat suppressed. And so here's that anterior inferior tib fib ligament, which is heterogeneous. You see some dark tissue there. You see a little bit here, but it's not all continuous. 
Now that could partly be because it's the angle in just one um, one plane, but there's too much fluid here interposed between ligament fibers. There's some in the interosseous space here, maybe a little bit along the posterior uh, tibia here. And an important part about this case is that there's this low signal line across the posterior tibia here and here. <clears throat> so this patient actually has a posterior malleolar fracture of the tibia, and it's also associated with this uh, syndesmosis sprain in this case. So treatment of a patient like this would depend on how wide this is and whether it's stable or not with weight bearing or stress views. So not all of these things are necessarily going to be surgical. Another thing we see fairly often, especially in, in a football athletes, is chronic injury. And I think you can appreciate here how much low signal tissue there is between the tibia and the fibula here. It's a section like <clears throat> several centimeters above the ankle joint. Um, and what happens is basically people get a lot of scar tissue formed and will get bone forming in the interosseous membrane region from a previous uh, syndesmosis or high ankle sprain. And we may see what looks like acute on top of chronic injury. So there can be that thickening of ligaments or interosseous membrane, and then there's another acute injury on top of it. So take a look at this fat suppressed T2 weighted image here, fibula, tibia. And so ligament should be coming across and attaching here, but it looks like it's stripped off the, the tibia here and posteriorly here, like this is that posterior component on coronal. And so it's too thick. So it's been injured before, but then it's been re-injured and is kind of avulsed partly off the tibia here. Um, I show the lower down sections on this patient because it illustrates that you, you can have a high ankle sprain without having a, a low ankle sprain. So this patient's anterior talofibular ligament, posterior talofibular ligament are pretty much intact. So he's got high ankle sprain, but not the traditional ankle sprain. Another kind of acute on chronic case where this interosseous membrane here is too thick. Again, normally you don't see very much tissue there, maybe just a millimeter thick or so. Here it's, here it's easily seen and thick extending between the tibia and the fibula. And there's fluid surrounding the tibia here going over towards the fibula. As you get down towards this patient's ankle um, articulation itself, really irregularity of the fibula and little nubs of tissue coming off that are probably the remnants of his tib-fib ligament complex. And, you know, these type of things are pretty common, like I said, in, in football, and uh, they may or may not be something that um, requires surgery. I'd say the majority of them end up not requiring surgery um, unless there's definite widening. <clears throat> Another thing, as far as the radiography goes on these, is to look for bone formation along the posterior tibia on lateral radiograph. So you see this is all extra bone that's formed in this um, football player. He had this acute on chronic injury where that extra bone is kind of here. There's periosteal reaction where the, the syndesmosis is sort of stripped off. Um, <clears throat> but this is a chronic situation. And that's, again, a very common kind of incidental thing to pick up on the radiographs. So what do the surgeons do? Um, well, again, the, the key thing is that they look at dynamic stability and, and how wide things are um, to decide how, uh, whether, whether surgery is, is going to be required or not. And, you know, maybe more than a couple millimeters above normal in terms of that tibiofibular space. What's the role of MRI? Well, it's to confirm the clinical diagnosis. There's a lot going on around the ankle, and it's not always clear that, in fact, the pain and tenderness a patient has is from that syndesmosis. So the MRI confirms the location of the injury. It does assess the degree of injury and, and mortis alignment. And probably as much as anything, it looks for other injuries like Taylor dome injuries, tendon injuries, lateral ligament sprains, otherwise, and so on. But it's really the clinical symptoms and the alignment that really determine the treatment. And there's some evolution in treatment going on. Um, traditionally, one might just see separate screws providing tibiofibular fixation. Um, this is a situation where there's actually a screw plate put along the fibula to, to sort of distribute the, the stress and two screws for the syndesmosis. This is a different situation where it's called a tightrope, and it's like a, it's a, it's a suture-type device that has buttons on either end of it, and those are drilled through the bone and then held on in place by these buttons. And those um, 
have a little bit of uh, flexibility to them, so it might be a little bit more physiologic. So that's something that you'll be maybe seeing in terms of uh, fixation. So, um, so that's a quick tour of syndesmosis injuries, and I can pause for a second and take a few questions if you would like.